and yet this extremely modest evidence that natural selection could do something was so thrilling to the Darwinian world uh, that uh, it became one of the most famous scientific uh, observations of all time. Now, what's going on here? Well, frankly, what's going on here is a cultural conflict. Evolutionary science has become a weapon in a cultural war. The illusion fostered by countless uh, public television programs, textbooks, and popular treatments is that the tools of empirical science have shown the naturalistic worldview to be true. Uh, but that isn't the case at all. What's happened is that the naturalistic worldview has been assumed at the beginning. Uh, and because of that, and because of the tremendous need to validate that view, uh, a, an extremely lenient uh, standard of evaluating the evidence uh, has been employed uh, so that one can credit marvels of creativity to mutation and selection that no one has ever seen, that no one ever will see, and that have not been recorded in the fossil record. Now that's metaphysics, not science, not empirical science, from the standpoint of one who doesn't take the metaphysics for granted. What's happened in neo-Darwinian theory is that in the service of naturalistic philosophy, a theory that's perfectly valid for certain small-scale changes, for the sorts of variations that appear, for example, when a small population of birds is blown to a distant island and inbreeds and has mutations and therefore may lose some of its capacities or may vary from the uh, uh, mainland population. The theory is perfectly valid at that level of minor changes that do not produce new kinds of organisms and that above all do not add to the genetic information, which is what should be the real subject of biological evolution. Now, these problems have been recognized all along by far-sighted people in the scientific community, by people like Pierre Grasset, the preeminent French zoologist of our time, Richard Goldschmidt, the Berkeley geneticist, uh, even by people like Stephen Jay Gould, my sometime adversary, uh, who uh, perhaps uh, f uh, feels embarrassed that his own attacks on every element uh, of the neo-Darwinian uh, scheme have been uh, quoted and used to discredit it. Uh, they understand that what has happened is that a theory value that is valid only at the small scale has been recklessly extrapolated into a general theory of creation uh, in order uh, to fill the gap that would otherwise exist. This theory has to be extrapolated because otherwise we wouldn't have a theory at all. And it's because this is recognized that you're now hearing from mathematical biologists like Stuart Kaufman, for example, that neo-Darwinism has fractures at its foundations, as he says in the introduction to his new book, and needs to be replaced or supplemented, it's never quite clear what, um, by some new theory based on computer models of self-organizing systems that may or may not have some existence in nature. Now, once again, I'm not here to tell you that there's no possibility that there's anything valid in these, these uh, theories, in this speculation, in these research programs. Uh, but I, what I am here to tell you is that the scientific community is recognizing a crisis. Year after year, people have come forward hoping to find the answer, hoping to find the new and general theory of evolution that Stephen Jay Gould said was emerging uh, to fill the gap left by what he said was the effectively dead neo-Darwinian synthesis. But nothing new emerges. No new adequate naturalistic explanation emerges, and so Gould himself has to go back, scurry back, and protect the neo-Darwinian synthesis because there is no alternative and because there would be a cultural earthquake if the scientific community had to admit a mistake and had to acknowledge that they really don't know the answers to questions that they have confidently assumed and told the public they did know the answers to. What I'm here to tell you is that it's possible to recognize this and debate it and discuss it in an academic forum, and I hope we're going to be doing a lot more of that in the future because it will have to happen. Biologists cannot be allowed to tell the cultural creation story without dissent from the rest of us. And now Professor Provine will offer his opening statement.
did you notice that he had nothing to say about his mechanisms of evolution? I've got a lot of thanks. I think it's wonderful that we're having a debate of this sort. It's really good for Stanford. It's good for people to get these issues out in the open. Phil is definitely a friend of mine, and that's something that you need to understand. Uh, we get up here, we argue like everything, and we'll have dinner and a beer together afterwards. <laughs> so I want to thank Phil. I want to thank Tim Jackson for being the moderator, Su Jen Lee and Table Talk for sponsoring this, for Stanford for letting it happen here at all, to the Evo Bio Group for its wonderful support, for Stanford's events and services that provided this week machine. And to the interview group with, with whom I visited for the last three days, a great group of folks, and uh, all my power is willpower, but none of it's free, folks. And uh, now I'll get on to the debate. Marcus, I couldn't have done this without you. Thank you so much. Let's look again at Phil's views. Phil is a born-again Christian. He believes that God exists, that God created life, and apparently successively created the major forms of life. God's design is apparent in the adaptations of animals and plants. God created humans separately because humans and chimpanzees do not share a common ancestor. God gives us life after death. And God gives us an absolute foundation for ethics. God gives us ultimate meaning in life. God gives humans free will and thus the possibility of genuine moral understanding and responsibility. Now, when it comes to the important questions, Phil has a very clear maxim, which is maximize your leaps of faith. Get them as big as you possibly can. Will has a maxim, too. Minimize your leaps of faith, is my argument, and that way you can actually live in a natural world. Now, it's strange when we think about Charles Darwin as a young man, because he believed all the same things that Phil believes now, with the exception of being born again. And the question is, what could have caused a smart fellow like Charles Darwin, and by the way, I don't claim that Darwin was all that smart. I believe that Phil Johnson is much smarter than Darwin. If Darwin had gone to Harvard, he'd have graduated near the bottom of his class. If he'd gone to the University of Chicago Law School, he probably would have flunked out. He never would have been asked to, to serve as a clerk for Earl Warren. But he did change his mind, and we're going to have to figure out why he changed his mind. He had a number of very direct reasons. First was the morphological similarity suggested that suggested shared descent, just plain morphological similarity. Secondly, similarity of living species to recently recent related fossils. Now, this is an issue that Phil does not work on very much. Indeed, the recent fossil record is quite good. And we can look in the fossil record, and we can see relatives of clearly different species that exist in the fossil record and are closely related, however, to living species. Darwin saw this when he was on the voyage of the Beagle. There, are, there is the similarity of different species occupying the same ecological niche in different but connected geographical areas. As, as Darwin went down the coast of South America, up the other coast, and around the world, he noticed that in similar ecological niches, there were related but different species. And finally, of course, there was a similarity of island species to related species on nearby mainlands. Darwin invented natural selection only after he had come up with the idea of evolution by descent, and that occurred only after the voyage of the Beagle. He believed that inventing the idea of natural selection was like committing murder. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew that he was murdering the cultural tradition in which he had been raised and in which Phil continues to live. 